Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at OneSpin with Dave Landau, who's going to talk today about how to improve functional coverage and verification. David, as we move into new markets such as automotive, medical, and industrial, coverage, um, reliability are absolutely critical, particularly in some of the prime circuits, because these literally are uh, life-critical type of uh, applications. What are you finding out in the marketplace in terms of what are people concerned about? What do they want to fix? So, well, what I'm finding is that there's a there's a, a history in terms of companies that are doing safety critical kind of designs. So, like for example, in avionics, I've been involved in avionics uh, since sort of about 2005, and what I'm finding there is that they know how to create these designs. They know how to do all this safety analysis and how to completely verify the design. But when you're getting into things like automotive, you've got a lot of new people that are getting into this space that don't have a background of doing this kind of complete and thorough verification. So for some of these companies that are getting into this space, it's, it's new and they're having to approach this from a much more thorough perspective than they've done in the past. And thankfully there are some new techniques, um, some of them that we can apply that, uh, that they can help uh, toward this regard. They're also pushing the limit in terms of process notes, too, on some of these designs, partly because their cycle is so, so slow that they don't want to be left behind as, as these things finally come out five years down the road, but partly also because things like AI need lots of processing power, lots of transistors. That makes it a much harder type of, of verification problem than it was in the past, in, even in avionics, right? That is absolutely correct. In fact, that's one of the, the, the key challenges. Avionics has had the, the luxury of having relatively small designs, typically going on FPGAs, where automotive, you're talking about much larger designs at much smaller process nodes. They're obviously much more expensive and going out in mass quantities. So you've, you've got to get this thing right. So they've, they're being pushed on, on multiple fronts, and they're also being pushed to get these designs into the cars faster to compete with, with competition. And so they're getting pressed both to try to create something that's gonna be incredibly safe and secure, but as well as uh, have the functionality that allows them to differentiate themselves against their competitors. It's a very competitive space. Why don't you draw this out for us? Absolutely. So what are you illustrating here? Right, so what I'm showing here is uh, maybe a larger SOC where you've got different types of uh, different com compute components up here. It might be a microprocessor, maybe a crossbar switch, maybe some peripheral devices down here. Um, this would be kind of just a standard platform that would uh, be used in the industry. And in an automotive AI chip, you may have thousands of these different elements sitting in there, right? Or even, even millions. That's correct. In fact, you can end up with a whole other piece of a chip that might be coming out here that might have um, additional processing components that are feeding data coming into this chip. So you could have auxiliary components that have much higher processing power and replicated cells. They can get quite complex. So what's the primary concern here? Is it, is it just reliability of the circuits, or is it does it go beyond that? It goes beyond. Um, so you've got multiple concerns here. So when you start getting into some of these spaces, what you're really worried about is, do these devices perform their, their function um, under all circumstances? And the issue there is there's always going to be corner cases anytime you do any kind of design. So the problem is, how are you going to verify that um, when you check the requirements for maybe this peripheral down here, how are you going to verify that that peripheral is always going to interact correctly? Maybe it's always going to interact getting the, the data going over to the memory or the data going over to someplace else. Is it going to drop something? Is it going to hit something where it gets stuck? Those are the kinds of conditions that, that are, are going to cause problems. And it's not just what it that it's designed to do, it's also what else it can be doing that it shouldn't be doing, right? That's absolutely correct. So that's one of the key areas that it's, um, you can specify requirements. So you might have, you know, requirement one, it has to do this function, requirement two, it has to do that function. But the question is, what else can it do that you're not aware of? Or when you verify one of these requirements, have you actually done a complete and thorough uh, job verifying that requirement? You're talking about things that it shouldn't be doing. One of the issues that comes into uh, safety and uh, reliability in a uh, automotive design, for example, and medical as well, and also industrial, is security. If there's code in there that shouldn't be behaving a certain way, can you pick that up? 
Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the important techniques that, that we can offer. So we have multiple different ways that we can analyze the design. One of the things that we can do is we can perform an analysis on, let's say, one of these requirements compared with the other definitions of the other requirements, and we can make sure that this specification actually encompasses the entire state space. And we can identify areas where there's a gap between these state spaces, and that would be an area of, it, it could be logic that simply hasn't been properly defined, properly verified, or it could be something nefarious that somebody put in that they were hoping to try to hide. And that's, that's one of the hard parts about security, is security can be just a bad design as well. You can create a, a security hole with a bad design as well as something coming in with malware. That's absolutely correct. In fact, from our perspective, we don't necessarily care whether it's something added nefariously or something added by accident. Um, it's just extra functionality that is going to have some undesirable outcome. And so from us, you know, it just looks like something that, that, that needs to be fixed or removed. What are the challenges with AI systems that's going into these, these uh, cars and uh, many other systems these days, AI seems to be almost everywhere, is that it modifies as it goes. Two devices can be exactly the same coming out of the factory, but they, they behave differently and they actually change over time. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that can be uh, extremely problematic. So, I mean, there, there's there, there's different ways this can be accomplished. Some people are accomplishing this through simply software. And so that would be an area that goes kind of beyond the techniques that, that uh, one's been, uh, you know, helps with. But there's other techniques that are trying to incorporate much more functionality into hardware, including things into FPGAs. So things like the biggest Xilinx FPGAs are allowing people to download these kinds of algorithms and modify them going forward and even self-modify uh, in some cases. So there's some really exciting things that are happening um, in the industry. And so what we're trying to do then is, is help these customers identify what are the different cases that they need to be sure are implemented and verified uh, correctly. So you've got to do all the things that you did before, plus you now have to look forward to all the things that potentially can change, right? That's, that's correct. You have to be forward thinking. And in fact, there are some uh, new areas in the way of security that are, are quite challenging where you have to actually anticipate what are the different ways this thing could be attacked in the future. So now people are using techniques that, you know, they're applying current techniques to designs from five years ago. Well, you didn't know these, these, uh, t these uh, attack vectors existed five years ago. So how do we anticipate things that can go wrong in the future, whether that's reliability or security? Yeah, it's extremely challenging. Is there enough commonality between all the different things that have to be checked and verified that you can continue using the, ex the same tools? Is it the tooling that has to change, or is it the application of how those tools are done that changes? Um, it's both. So I, what I think is we have to continue to, to enhance the technology. So I think the underlying techniques are sufficient, but I think that what we have to do is provide additional automation so that we can encapsulate some of this functionality so that we can make it easier for people to adopt and, and easier to use. So I think that fundamentally what we're talking about is, is transistors, gates, registers. I mean, it's the same stuff, but the way it's connected together and the problems we need to be uh, encapsulating the kind of analysis that can be done so that we can get that into the hands of people that can actually perform the analysis uh, on, a, on a schedule and on a budget. Also, in addition to these being new problems, a lot of these chips are coming out in much narrower batches, narrower market segments, smaller batches. Mm -hmm. They're being produced almost custom, semi-custom for the application. Do the same tools and approaches work from one area to another, or does everything now have to be customized according to that? Well, what we're seeing is that there's been a quite a strong push into uh, the FPGA market. So FPGAs have been growing in, in complexity and, and capabilities. And what, what that's enabling is applications that previously you had to go to, a, uh, to, to an ASIC in order to get the kind of speed and functionality. And now for these smaller markets, you can actually realistically go after an FPGA. So when you're at the, the higher level uh, design, uh, then you can actually use these same techniques that we're talking about. That doesn't matter if you're going to an ASIC or an FPGA. But we're seeing is that it's uh, the retooling happens more on the implementation side. So what we're seeing is that more and more people are having to adopt these FPGA tools that might be new or different. And FPGA back-end processes are very different than ASIC. 
And so that, that, that's one of the, the areas that, uh, that we can help is with the FPGA equivalency checking, which is another unique challenge. So that's, you know, that's one of the examples of an area where the tooling is actually quite a bit different than, uh, than it is on, on the ASIC front. But it's, a, it's really exciting to see what you might be able to do with these FPGAs going forward. I mean, you've got the ability then to take something that's you know, extremely large and be able to, to place it in something like an automobile and then have it be reprogrammed. Uh, that has additional challenges. What if somebody reprograms it with something that's undesirable? But it has advantages because now you can have field upgrades just overnight while you're sleeping. Your car can upgrade itself. It's, there's it's exciting times uh, ahead of us. David Landau, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much.